And in the end, she sailed. And I have to say, it looks magnificent. In the last couple of weeks, we finally had high resolution pictures and videos of the new Chinese Type 003 because it just completed, at the time of filming, its first sea trials. Even though we recently discussed together China and the Chinese strategy, while it is time for an update specifically focused on this new aircraft carrier, and finding reliable information, it's not that easy. So the Fujian is a conventionally powered Katobar carrier built by the Jiangyan shipyard in Shanghai. It was laid down probably in late 2015 and it was launched in June 2022. And as we all have seen, it completed its first sea trial in May 2024. The Chinese are always very quick, but it is reasonable to expect at least a year of sea trials, another year of air operations trials, and some additional six months to one year to have a basic carrier wing operating from the carrier. A very basic one. Now, the sources agree that the displacement is about 72,000 tons at normal load, reaching around 81,000 at full load. Some sources give higher estimates, but this seems to be the consensus. The power plant was believed to be an integrated electric propulsion, but it is not. It has eight boilers and 14 turbines, powering four shafts with four propellers. The installed power is 160 megawatts. For comparison, the American Kitty Hawk class had 210 megawatts of power installed, but the ship was slightly larger, but it displaced about the same at full load. Obviously, there is no spec sheet that you can download from the plan website, so all these numbers and information has been collected or inferred by fragments of information appeared in the press, online, or through interviews with Chinese officials. So, while researching, I realized that not only we don't know much, but we also don't know what we don't know. And inferring too much is a dangerous game because, um, no, well, I, I'm getting ahead of me. Obviously, the major element we are interested in is the air component and its management. One of the major talking points is the adoption of electromagnetic catapults. This is often portrayed as skipping a generation because the US, before adopting the EMOS, used steam-activated catapults for more than half a century, I believe. But... This is really not the case. Think of it, if you want to start building aircraft today, you don't start building wooden biplanes. You start with a general aviation monoplane made of aluminium and composites. So there was no point in trying an already obsolete technology. These catapults have gone through a long development on the ground and it seems that they went through successful tests on board launching dead weights. We will see. Three of them are installed on the ship, which is one less than any US carrier designed in modern times. This obviously has implications. The sortie's rate is physically limited by the number of catapults. So why this choice? I suspect that the Chinese hit two limits. One is the room available and the other is the power available. We don't know the detailed design of the Chinese catapults, but it is conceivable that they are a bit larger than the American equivalent. Moreover, it is not that you just plug the power cable into the socket and you're good to go. The system for storing energy is quite complex on the American ships, and we can't expect the Chinese ones to be much smaller. If anything, the first iteration of a technology is usually the bulkiest. And anyway, the ship is smaller than a Nimitz or a Ford, and the three catapults are all of the same size, so, well, it sort of makes sense. Now, before the usual trolls make everyone notice in the comments, yes, I know that the emails are less impacting on the ship because they don't require steam pipes, valves, and accumulators from the boilers, so thank you, okay? 
Furthermore, the ship doesn't have an excess of engine power available, so it is conceivable that the electric power is also limited and maybe four catapults were just too much. If this is the case, the coming Type 004, which is going to be nuclear powered, may well have four catapults. We'll see. Another element influencing the air operation is the presence of just two aircraft elevators, both on the starboard side. The US carriers have three, which is better for moving the aircraft around and for redundancy. I've read some analysis that this is a heritage of the Soviet design at the root of the Liaoning and Shandong, but it seems unlikely to me that Chinese do not lack naval architects and the ship is big enough to house all three of them. So I don't have a real explanation and we will leave this for now. If you read around, there are all sorts of wild guesses related to the air wing composition. The truth is, we don't have a shred of official information. The most reasonable answer is probably that the carrier wing composition is going to be variable and it will be tailored for the specific mission. And the mission of this aircraft carrier is going to be, well, well let's not put the cart ahead of the horses. So the first interesting piece of news is that the Chinese are developing a carrier variant for their advanced trainer JL-10, which is the J variant. If there was any doubt that the Chinese are really serious, this should be enough to remove them. In the years from the commissioning of the Liaoning in 2012 till today, the Chinese carriers have been focused on producing trained pilots and personnel. This is a slow process. Since this is the first Katobar carrier, there is also the necessity of extending the training of the current pilots and start establishing a new generation of personnel trained in Katobar operations. If I had to guess, the JL-10 will be the first aircraft really operating from the carrier. Of course, this won't stop the integration of other aircraft, but it will take probably a year of intensive training to have the pilots and the personnel ready to deploy a more or less complete carrier wing and fly safely to and from the carrier. The main combat component, at least at the beginning, will be based on the J-15. The J-15 isn't a great platform. It is the reverse engineering of the Russian Sohoi 33, an aircraft that the Russians themselves have been considering obsolete for many years now. However, that was what was available to the Chinese and it has contributed to creating the first and second generation of Chinese naval aviators. But the aircraft, as it is today, it is configured for stobar operations, so to operate from the Fujian, it must be modified to launch from a catapult. And since they were already back to the drawing board, this is the point that the, when the Chinese decided to fix the problem. Since the J-15 is basically a flanker, which is a platform that is almost infinitely adaptable, and since the Chinese have a massive experience in upgrading flankers, well, they basically decided to go all in. The J-15B is currently being tested because other than the structural improvement required to be catapult launched, it has been provided with an entirely new avionic suite, modernized a radar and it has been integrated with the PL-10 and the PL-15 air-to-air weapons. And since it is a multi-role aircraft, most of the Chinese air launch weapons are being integrated as well. The aircraft would benefit from some more thrust, but it seems that the engines have not been upgraded, but basically most of the rest it was. And they also designed a dual-seater training version, which in turn is the base for a dual-seater electronic warfare variant, the J-15D. It has been developed, but it has never been seen operating from the Liaoning or the Shandong. Albeit it seems that this is going to happen because mockups have been seen on board of the Liaoning. While we do not have any picture of a Katobar prototype, it is only reasonable to expect that the Fujian will carry a few of these aircraft. So, if the J-15 is overall an old aircraft, then the J-35 is exactly the opposite. The J-35 is a medium-weight fighter with stealth features. It features a general configuration similar to the F-35, but it is a totally indigenous design. 
The engine is the Chinese WS13. It features two weapon bays and six wing hard points with an estimated maximum payload of eight tons. The radar is a modern AESA radar and it has infrared sensors integrated into the aircraft. It is currently in development and it is unclear if it features the key fifth generation hallmark, which is passive and collaborative targeting. Mockups have been seen on the Fujian, but also on the Stobart carriers, so the Chinese are likely going to operate it from all the fleet carriers. The aircraft is currently in development and at least two prototypes are flying. The J-35 is a derivative of the Shenyang FC-31, a private venture that was heavily modified for carrier use. The first flight was in 2021, so it is still relatively early in the development to be able to say too much about it. Some say that it looks like an F-35 because China stole a large amount of classified data from Lockheed Martin. While the data leak is indeed true, if you think that this is going to simplify the life of the Chinese engineers, I think you are deluded. Whatever they found, those are not recipes to cook a dish. It's orders of magnitude more complex. Those data are useful to assess the performance of a potential opponent. They are useful as a benchmark. But if you think that you can copy something like an F-35, you have no idea of what you're talking about. I know that I will be taking a lot of flack for this, but when it comes to anything with a high technological content, China definitely takes inspiration, but just scooping is simply impossible. But there is a better reason why China is not just scoping. And I will explain it right after covering what I believe is the most important element in the upcoming carrier wing. The KJ-600 is a carrier-capable AWACS. The general configuration reminds of the American E-2 uh, being a turboprop with two engines, with six crew members and a large round radar on top. The radar is different from the standard configuration of the Chinese AWACS. In fact, for example, the large and ground-based KJ-2000 has fixed AISA raised, arranging a triangular configuration, each covering a 120 degree sector. In the case of the KJ600 though, a similar arrangement would have implied quite small arrays. So the preference has been for a single one-sided rotating array. And we know that it is like this because the dielectric covered just one half of the rotodome. The aircraft sports a forest of antennas and various analysts have reason to believe that the level of integration the Chinese are going for is not inferior to what is possible with advanced data links like the American model. Moreover, from the same airframe it is possible to derive other aircraft like anti-submarine and maritime patrol aircraft, transport aircraft, electronic warfare and surveillance and so on. I would expect to see some of these variants in a not so far future. So at the end of the day, what is going to be the carrier wing composition? Well, as I said, it may well be variable and it will be time dependent. At different points in time in the future, it will have different compositions. If I had to hypothesize, considering what we have seen on the other Chinese carriers, there will probably be the following who we'll say 40 to 45 combat aircraft as a mix of J-15B and J-35, 4 to 6 J-15D for electronic warfare, 4 J-600 because with 4 you can maintain a 24 hours operation, 7 to 10 helicopters because the Chinese tend to have quite a lot of helicopters, some of them are AWACS and they won't be needed on the Fujian but still the Chinese like having helicopters on the carrier. It is also likely that in the near future the carrier will feature a naval variant of the J-11 drone, but so far we have only artists' impression or scale models. So the first element to notice in all of this is that the effort the Chinese are pouring into creating a high-end carrier force is, simply put, enormous. At least four different aircraft types are in development and they are doing it at a pace that is unconceivable in the West. Just consider the time that the Royal Navy took to put in service the two carriers or the timeline for the new French Pang. We know for a fact that the Type 004 project has started already in Dalian, 
and the fact that the Fujian Hull number is 18 while the Type 004 is 20 is suggesting that we are going to see another Type 003 likely built in Shanghai. I know what many will be screaming at this point, but I am a Chinese shell because the US Navy has a century of experience in running an expeditionary carrier force while China has barely any experience. According to these people, there is no chance that China is going to become a real opponent to the US in the foreseeable future. Well, the first consideration I have is why they must be opponents? Is the art of diplomacy and compromise dead in the 21st century? I really don't understand this level of rivalry between two countries that, at the end of the day, not like they are now, but potentially, they don't need each other. It's beyond my comprehension. I actually may have an answer, but this will take us way too far. However, beyond this consideration that is mostly political, it is a fact that the Chinese do not have the culture and the experience of the US Navy or other European navies. But this is changing. With every training exercise, with every cruise, with every mission, the gap becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. The Chinese have shown remarkable abilities to grow and evolve, and wherever I look, I only see improvements. So trust me, I have no particular sympathy for the Chinese establishment, but I can't say what I don't think it is true just to cater to a public who only wants confirmation of its own bias. But leaving all this aside, there is a second and more subtle element to consider. As I said at the beginning, we have very little officially confirmed information. So, obviously, we extrapolate and try to infer the solution to our questions. And in so doing, we face the risk of projecting ourselves onto the Chinese thinking. Typically, we think that if it is not like us, well, it's worse. At least when it comes to weapon systems. Well, maybe it's not true. Uh, maybe the Chinese have in mind different missions or postures than those that we would have if we were in their shoes. So just saying that the Fujian is the beginning of a force like the United States Carrier Force with the same missions and the same doctrine, well, it is not necessarily true. And actually, that is my thinking. I am not sure what is going to happen. I have a couple of ideas in mind that I covered already in a different videos, but I'm sure that we will be surprised somehow. In fact, one peculiarity of the Chinese is their typical approach to the challenge. While the Russians tend to look for asymmetric solutions, the Chinese have both a symmetric and an asymmetric approach. For example, they introduced hypersonic and anti-ship ballistic weapons, which are an asymmetric threat, but they are also trying to catch up in the most symmetric competition, that is, carrier-based operations. And by the way, this is the reason why coping makes little sense if you just dig a little bit under the surface. Because if you want to reply asymmetrically, by definition, you don't have anything to copy, you need to come up with something new. But if you want to reply symmetrically, then coping is useful up to a point because you may want something better than your opponent. And for those who are now foaming at the mouth saying that everybody knows that the Chinese are only good at coping, I'm not saying that they never did, I'm saying that now they are beyond that stage. So I think that I put off enough people for today. If you want to go a bit deeper on this subject, there is a very long and detailed discussion on how the Chinese carrier force could be used in a real confrontation. And this is in the video that is going to appear beside me. I'm sure you will love it. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you to Patreon and members for their support and see you next time.